Welcome to 21st Century Conversations. My name is Nzinga Shani. Our conversation this evening is about understanding Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is one of those diseases or health problems that everyone is afraid of getting because we don't quite know how to fix it. And November is Alzheimer's Awareness Month. But for those who are suffering from Alzheimer's or their loved ones and their caregivers, every day is the awareness day for Alzheimer's. Every day is a good day to teach and to help people to understand what it is and to help them to cope. And this evening, I have four guests who are very, very intimately involved with either the treatment, management, or interacting with a loved one who has this disease. And my guests are going to introduce themselves to you. And I'm going to start with my far left, Dr. Tampi. Tell us about you. My name is Rajesh Tampi, and I'm the Director of Behavioral Health at Masonic Care. And I'm also an Associate Clinical Professor of Psychiatry at uh, Yale University School of Medicine and an attending psychiatrist at the Adler Geriatric Assessment Center. Thank you very much. And we're going to come back and ask you to clarify dementia for us sure. as versus Alzheimer's or Lewy body or something else. Maria? My name is Maria Tomasetti. I'm the South Central Regional Director of the Alzheimer's Association Connecticut Chapter. The Alzheimer's Association provides information, education, support, and programs for people with dementia, their family caregivers, and other caregivers. Thank you. Wendy. Hi. Uh, my name is Wendy DeLuca, and my mother, for the past seven years, has had a form of dementia known as frontal temporal dementia, so um, I'm uh, one of her caregivers. Thank you, and you're going to tell us a lot more about what that is like, right, to take care of your mom. Diane. I'm Diane Davis. I'm a nurse and a geriatric case manager at the Adler Geriatric Assessment Center at Yale New Haven Hospital, and I function as a case manager physician team with Dr. Tampi and with other physicians at the center, and we take care of people on the memory loss spectrum from mild to really end-stage dementia. Okay. Thank you all for being here. As I don't have to tell you, you all know that this is a critically important topic. And there is a lot of misinformation um, out there. One just has to go on the internet and put in the world uh, Alzheimer's, and you get a range of information, not all of which are very factual. The, the disease of Alzheimer's, we talk about Alzheimer's disease, but it's really we're talking about dementia. So Dr. Tampi, tell us about dementia and where on the spectrum does Alzheimer's fall? Well, you know, dementia is the rubric of con uh, conditions that are present with worsening cognitive problems, that is memory being one of those cognitive problems with associated change in function and change in behavior. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. There are other types of mm -hmm. dementias like vascular dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, frontotemporal dementias, dementia associated with Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, and other neurodegenerative conditions. So when you talk about dementias, you're talking about not only cognitive problems with memory being the most common, mm -hmm. but also behaviors and also functional changes. Okay. And Alzheimer's seems to be the one that mm -hmm. most people are afraid of. What percentage of the people with dementia would you say have Alzheimer's? It is between 50 and 70 percent of patients with dementia. The most common cause is Alzheimer's disease. Uh huh. And what's the, the second most common? Uh, in the United States, yes. it is vascular dementia, but if you go to Southeast Asia, a vascular dementia is the most common cause, followed by mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease followed by other kinds of dementia, like Lewy body dementia, dementia with Parkinson's disease, and Huntington's disease. Now you're saying Asia and Europe, um, Alzheimer's is not the number one. In, in United States and Europe, Alzheimer's disease is the number one cause. Uh -huh. But in Southeast Asia, where there are more higher vascular comorbidities, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, you know, high cholesterol, they have more number of vascular dementia patients than Alzheimer's disease. I see. Diane, at the um, Adler Center, what do you see most of? At the Adler Center, we're actually not a terribly high-tech place. We really 
uh, see people who present with problems in their care and obviously one of the things we hope to do is to establish a diagnosis for them but equally important is the case management function which is really helping families to navigate their way through um, the maze of services that might be available for them in the community, uh, care planning decisions that they might need to make mm -hmm. including um, how long can people remain at home, um, helping families to educate themselves so that they are prepared for what might come down the pike for them in terms of dealing with changes in mood and behavior and declining function. So it's really the care of the patient and the family together as a, as a team because they really are. The patients can't, with Alzheimer's can't survive without uh, care in the community either from the families or from um, institutional care. So that our, we really see our main focus is meeting the patients and the families where they are and helping them with the care problems that they identify. But the people, but you see people on the spectrum. You see we do. everybody. Mm -hmm. We have a one minute video that gives a 3D um, explanation about Alzheimer's disease. And we're going to put that up on the screen for you. It's one minute. Dementia is a chronic state of confusion in which the patient finds it hard to remember, learn, and communicate. It is also characterized by the formation of senile plaque involving the accumulation of beta amyloid and abnormal neurofibrillary tangles. Beta amyloid is derived from a larger molecule called amyloid precursor protein, or APP. APP is normally present on the cell surfaces, and the cleavage of APP results in the formation of beta amyloid. Neurofibrillary tangles consist of insoluble twisted fibers that are found inside the brain's cells. The tau protein is abnormal and the microtubule structures collapse. Recent drugs like inhibitors of cerebral acetylcholine esterase have been shown to be of some benefit to Alzheimer's patients. Okay, so that video, um, Dr. Tampi, tells us in 3D format what this is. Pathology for the development of Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. I think it is a good, good sort of schematic representation mm -hmm. what actually happens with uh, and why patients get the uh, changes in the brain that they're supposed to get. Yes, neurofibrillary tangles and uh, the senile plaques are the most common cause for why patients end up with the symptoms that they present with Alzheimer's disease. I see. And so th that gives people a really crisp, sharp idea that right. they can work with. Okay. Now, the, the next thing we want to talk about is this young onset of Alzheimer's. Now, I want to ask uh, Wendy, because Wendy's mom has, well, your mom was diagnosed in her 60s, right? Yes. So you said before 65, that's considered early onset. Your mom was diagnosed at 67? She was diagnosed at 67, and the symptoms really started to present themselves when she was 64, 65. Ah, so would she classify as early onset at yes, 65? Yes, but you know, unfortunately this is what happens with patients with dementia is the pathology and the symptomatology may start very ahead on, mm -hmm. but people think it is part of normal aging. Yes. So you say, you know, we'll help them out and this is nothing wrong, and people are in denial with, uh, you know, the symptoms of the disease. So the actual diagnosis takes about three to four years before, from the when mm -hmm. the symptoms actually uh, start. So when she was diagnosed at six to seven, at six to four, you're saying that she could have been Definitely. Looking back, it's easy now to say, oh, yes, in those hindsight. strange circumstances or strange behaviors were really early signs of it. What, <clears throat> what led you to taking her to get diagnosed? What were some of the things that you saw that made you uncomfortable? Um, extreme, sharp changes in her personality and in Give us her an example. behavior. Um, for example, um, interrupting people rudely, um, not being able to um, understand social cues, um, mm. laughing at inappropriate jokes. Um, and she never did that before. Exactly. Very different for her. Additionally, with my mother's form of dementia, she had a lot of speech problems from the start. So um, she is now completely mute, but in the very beginning, she was not able to form words. Um, so it was like a, an extreme form of stuttering almost. 
So her sentences would miss words, um, be lacking mm. full, you know, there mm -hmm. wasn't a full sentence. Um, she would, um, it, it wasn't so much as she was forgetting the word for something. She just wasn't able to actually speak. Um, it was, um, it was very scary. And how long from the time when you noticed this, where she was behaving inappropriately, you know, socially, how long did it take from that time to the time where she lost her speech? Oh, uh, let's see. She was diagnosed in 2006 and was mute as of the fall of 08. So two wow. years. Uh, one, uh, two, two years. Within two years, she had lost all ability to speak. Now, uh, Dr. Tampi, is that particularly a short span of time? Is that normal well, you know, Wendy's for the frontal temporal lobe? Frontal temporal dementia is, uh, you know, the type of frontal temporal dementia that you have. Frontal temporal dementia used to be called as Pick's disease before. Yes. Uh, but only 25% of people with frontal temporal dementia do have, uh, you know, the Pick cells, which are cells in the, in the brain. And of the frontal temporal dementia, there are three different varieties, the frontal variety, the, uh, the temporal variety, and the primary progressive aphasia. Wendy's mom, because I treated her, mm -hmm. uh, she had a mixed type of dementia where she had a combination of all these uh, oh, three. So you can have a mixed type, yes. not just one thing. And do we know why some people have a mixed type and one just have a straight Well, you know, the, it type? depends upon the pathology where it happens. In patients with Alzheimer's disease, the pathology is mainly in the temporal cortex, followed by the parietal cortex with the involvement of the frontal cortex later on. Whereas in patients with frontotemporal dementia, it is the other way around. The frontal cortex gets involved first, followed by the temporal cortex, and then, if possible, the, uh, the parietal cortex. Usually what happens in, uh, in the patients with dementia, as the dementia progresses, you will see that all the areas of the brain get involved. So in the end, all the dementias practically look the same. Oh, I see, I see. And Dr. Tempe, I would also n add on a personal level that I absolutely see that at the nursing home, the care facility where my mother is. Um, as, as the patients progress, you would not know the difference between my mother's diagnosis and her roommate's diagnosis. And her roommate has something, it's called something right. else. Mm -hmm. But, but um, earlier when we were talking in the pre-production, you said, uh, Dr. Tampi, that the, what Wendy's mom has is no longer called Pick's disease. That's correct. It was, so for people in Washington, we want to make it clear that Pick's disease is the same thing now being called? As frontotemporal dementia. Frontal temporal dementia. dementia. Why the name change? The reason is uh, Pick's, the, the name Pick's came from the person who uh, diagnosed the disease. Uh, yeah. And these are cells which are found in the, in the brain. And Pick cells are seen only in 25% of patients with frontotemporal dementia. So uh -huh. to call everybody who has frontotemporal dementia as having Pick's disease is wrong. Like I said, there are three different varieties, and it depends upon where the pathology actually starts. So there is the frontal variant, then there is the temporal variant, and then there is the primary progress of aphasia patients, where they have significantly more speech problems than patients with, you know, even the frontotemporal dementia, frontal variant types. Uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease, the speech problems are later, but in patients with primary progressive aphasia type of frontotemporal dementia, they're much ahead. Those may be the presenting symptom, mm -hmm. and then the cognitive changes do happen. Maria, w uh, the Alzheimer's Association is working to help families and patients. Mm -hmm. What are the key things you do? And when people come call for help, what, what are they looking for? What type of help and what do you do? Uh, the first thing that we try to explain to people, it's interesting when we're out there, people think that if their diagnosis of their loved one is not Alzheimer's disease, that we can't help them. So first uh, of all, our support services are for people with any type of dementia. It's not limited to Alzheimer's disease. I think that's so important to say and bears repeating because many people think, oh, well, my mother has something else or my sister has something else. And if it's not Alzheimer's, then I can't go to Alzheimer's Association. So tell us about this range of service and also tell us about that this thing that's listed on the internet where anywhere in Connecticut you are there are so services right. so, so, so tell a, us that please sure. there's a 24/7 helpline yes. um, and that helpline is 
pretty much you call that number um, with a Connecticut area code and you will reach the Connecticut helpline. If you called from Florida, uh, you would get the Florida helpline. It's a national number. Oh, that's the 1-800-272? 3900. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Um, and it's any type of question. Some people call right um, after there's been a diagnosis and we just don't know where to start. Can you help us get started? Because um, people are diagnosed from all different types of places. Some it's diagnostic center, sometimes it's a family doctor, sometimes it's a neurologist, sometimes uh -huh. it's a geriatric physician, so a variety of places. Sometimes it's, um, I want information on home care agencies or community resources, or um, we need a break. Are there any programs that can help to- Like respite, respite care. care yeah, kinds of things like that. Uh -huh. Or, you know, how do I communicate with my loved one? Or I just need to talk. Um, where can I find support groups, um, information like that? So again, this hotline or this 24-7 line is 1-800-272-3900. And you're saying if someone is in Hamden, Connecticut or Rocky Hill, Connecticut, anywhere they are, mm -hmm. but if they're in Florida, and they call, they, they will still get... They'll get the Florida chapter if they're in Florida. If they're That's in California, they get a California chapter. So they get rooted to their particular so, chapter. So it's, it's a national... Yeah. Okay, and now the Alzheimer's Association of Connecticut, the website is... Yep. www.alz.org slash ct. And that provides information both from our national office and our Connecticut chapter. Both are accessible from that same website. Tell us a little bit, Maria, about the um, this sort of respite care thing that... Yeah. Uh, a lot of families, and I can tell you I was also a family caregiver, and families try to do things sometimes on their own without a break. Um, but families soon realize that they can't do it on their own. They need some sort of assistance. And actually, um, my mom had been diagnosed at um, Adler Geriatric Assessment Center, and uh, the great advice I heard was, you need a break now. Um, and we found a way to do it. Um, some families can pr private pay for their own care, but many families cannot afford to pay for their own break. So we, through the chapter, have a small chapter respite grant, but there are also programs through the state of Connecticut called the Connecticut Statewide Respite Care Program that can help to provide a break for that primary caregiver and care for the loved one with dementia. Okay, I want you to go back a little. You said you have a small respite grant, and I'm going to ask you, uh, Ms. Davis, to tell us about how you help these families to find the right kind of care or support system. but. Maria, I want to come back to you. You said you have a small respite grant mm -hmm. um, that helps. What do you do with that grant? Mm -hmm. How do you use yeah. it? So both that small respite grant and the Connecticut Statewide Respite Care Grant can be used by families for home care, for um, homemaker, companion, adult day center care, uh, short-term stay in a facility, facility, whatever type of break is most needed by the family. I see. So like Wendy, who is caring for her mom, if Wendy, if you needed to go off for a weekend or to go out and celebrate your birthday, if you couldn't afford to pay for it yourself, the respite place either through Adler or through you, the statewide group or through, if you live in Hamden, through you, mm -hmm. she could get somebody to give her a right. break. Right. Mm -hmm. The important so thing is that with the Connecticut Statewide Respite Care Grant, it's, um, there are income and asset guidelines yes. um, that have to, but, but if families qualify, then they're able to, you know, to get some kind of a break. And often families will use it for, um, we just need one day a week, our loved one will go to an adult day center and we yes. can do things like shopping and errands or just, just you know, just have a, a break for, for a few hours a day, um, home care, help with anything like this. So it's a, it's a great need and it gives families that little breather to be able to continue with their caregiving. Okay, support. I want to give you some quick facts. As of this year, 2012, 5.4 million Americans are living with dementia. The most common form of dementia in the United States is Alzheimer's disease. One in eight older Americans has Alzheimer's. Again, you said that is has dementia That's as correct, opposed yeah. to Alzheimer's. Um, Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, and the only cause of death among the top 10 in the United States that cannot be prevented, cured, or slowed. And we're gonna talk about this slowing piece. Um, more than 15 million Americans provide unpaid care valued at $210 billion. So people like you, 
you, all these are the people who have loved ones that they're caring for and they're not paid to provide the care, that care is worth $210 billion. In 2012, the direct cost of caring for those with Alzheimer's or with dementia paid through Medicare and Medicare was estimated to be $140 billion and another $60 billion is paid by other providers. So it's, it's a major, major issue in our community. Tell us, uh, Diane, when someone comes in to be evaluated with a loved one and that person has been dealing with a range of issues with this person, maybe for the last year and a half before they actually come, what's the first thing you do for them? So we interview the patient, obviously, and examine them and test their, their memory and other cognitive functionings. But, but even more important, we talk with the family about their perspective, since the individual with dementia is not necessarily the best reporter about yes. their own history and what's going on with them. And we try to get some sense of what the history has been from the family, how long has this been going on, whether the memory difficulties are now severe enough that they've started to affect their day-to-day -day functioning, usually the more complicated things first, mm -hmm. like driving or managing their medications, but ultimately issues related to self-care. If they're not able to do their own activities of daily living, who has stepped up to help with that? Mm -hmm. So we really pay a lot of attention to what is the family structure, what kind of support does the primary caregiver have from family, and whether they have already found resources within the community. And then based on that, we can tailor a plan. We'll say, this is what we, this is what we think the diagnosis is. These are the medications that we think might be helpful. If someone is depressed, we always treat the depression to see whether we can improve them. But then we say, okay, they're not able to bathe themselves anymore. Mm -hmm. who's, who's doing that? Do we need to bring a, a home health aid in to help with that? Um, can, are they safe to be left alone? Do mm -hmm. they need a homemaker companion? And then we point families in the direction of that care in the community. So we do a little bit of financial screening since the state supported programs, as Maria said, have both income and asset uh, limitations for people mm -hmm. who are eligible. But we hook people, families up with adult day centers, with agencies in the community uh, that provide homemakers, companions, Meals on Wheels. Uh, we refer them to the Alzheimer's Association for support. And we really try to send the message to the families that they're not going to be in this alone anymore. That as case managers, we're going to be with them through this journey. The Alzheimer's Association can be with them through this journey and they don't have to go it alone. Okay, and we want to let people know how to get in touch with the Dorothy Adler Geriatric Assessment Center. It is at 874 Howard Avenue in New Haven. The website is three w's yNHH.org forward slash geriatric. The phone number is 203-688-6361. Now, another thing you should know about is if none of these numbers you can remember or you didn't write them down, InfoLine. InfoLine in Connecticut is 211. You can call InfoLine if you feel that something is going on, you do not understand, you don't know where to turn. InfoLine, call them and tell them what your needs are or what is happening, and they will refer you to either the Alzheimer's Association, to the Geriatric Center, or to other resources. Um, Maria told us about the statewide resource uh, before. Also, we want to tell you that Masonic